Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I realized kind of belatedly as I was finishing these slides five minutes ago that the universe of data is kind of a large topic. Um, but I will attempt to go through some high-level ways of thinking about this, breaking it down, um, demystifying a lot of the buzzwords and vocab that you hear. Um, and keep in mind that basically every single bullet point of every slide is probably worthy of its own talk. Um, so if there's anything that you want to deep dive into later um, after the talk, happy to chat one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but with that, I will attempt to address the universe of data. So um, this is definitely breath for search, uh, but I'm going to attempt to answer some of these questions. Um, first, like what is going on uh, right now, uh, different ways you can think about it, problems that we need to solve today. Um, how you can be a part of this if you're not already, and places to learn more. Um, so first of all, there's a ton of terms, and I'm just going to establish like how we're going to talk about these terms now to avoid confusion. Um, a lot of times, I think people throw out like data science, machine learning, AI, and it's very unclear what that encompasses and what that doesn't encompass. Um, I like to think of these three as somewhat distinct terms. Um, so data engineering, data science, and deep learning. Uh, and I'll go into sort of how to cut these so that it's not super confusing. Um, so if you haven't seen this already, uh, this is coming from Monica Rogatti, who uh, is in, right now like independent you know, data consultant, similar to me, except she's several, several more years down the line and way more advanced. Um, and she came up with this uh, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but for data. And I think it's a really good way to sort of separate out the different layers that you need to start with. And one thing I'll note is that, so this is a little bit old in that you don't need to sort of go every single layer to get to self-actualization slash AI. Um, but for a lot of current ML systems, uh, you do need sort of everything below that layer. Um, so a lot of times when people think about machine learning, they think about just this, and they don't realize like a lot of other things that have to happen before that. Um, so I think one good way to break this down is thinking about what layer of problem you need to solve to unblock the next layer. Um, so collecting the data in the first place, um, you, now you can add things like you know IoT to that, moving and storing data, um, exploring transforming data, aggregating and labeling data, finally learning and optimizing data, and then at the very top, um, which we'll talk about at the end, AI. So uh, the whole point is that you can't read anything on the slide <laughs> because it's just a really small sample. Um, so this was updated um, in late, sort of like mid-2018, so um, it's already been over a half year. But uh, some people from FirstMark attempted to capture just several of the like, main companies that are in various spaces of analytics, or you know, BI tooling, or data sources, or infrastructure. Um, and the whole point is that it's really overwhelming to look at. And this is why I think for anyone who's like, curious about data, for them to just Google various buzzwords, it's very unclear how to learn from that. Um, so the TLDR, what isn't a data company these days, um, pretty much everything, and words are super confusing. Um, and just to like zoom out a little bit on a global scale, um, I'll talk about AI at the end as well, but this is something that is not really like in the future happening, you know, yet to happen. This is something that's like happening now where a lot of the major countries are starting to come out with their AI plans. And if you look at just last year, um, it's already like over twice as many countries from 2017. Um, and, you know, I think there's two sort of scenarios this can go down. One, you, you know, become a part of the future as fast as possible. You try to come up with policy. You try to like have funds going towards it. Um, you try to think about, you know, how you would like regulate it. Um, or two, you get left behind. So, oh, and like the, the ones that are glowing are China and the US. <laughs> um, so this is sort of my first stab 
at starting to talk about these three different sort of pillars of data engineering, data science, and deep learning. Um, and I think a good way to approach this is looking through the different roles and like the types of problems they solve. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the misnomers that you hear. Um, and the reason I sort of chose these terms over these terms is because it's a bit more specific. And the more specific you can get, I think the less confusion there is. So, so big data is a misnomer for data engineering because what, what is big data? Like, how do you know you have it? How do you know, like there was a sort of like a, a tweet that I saw at some point, which was big data is just a bunch of little data stacked in a tall trench coat. Um, <laughs> And it's very unclear like when you have it, and if you do have it, like it's also very unclear what you're doing with that. Um, but the real thing that you're doing is you're engineering a data system. So um, the mindset you want to have for someone who's doing this is really an infrastructure engineer. So you're thinking of someone who's sort of building a base that everyone else can build on top of. And um, you know what I would think of if I had to call out one prereq is, they understand sort of distributed systems. They understand how to like, you know, move things, a lot of data across a lot of clusters, and they know how to optimize these systems. So you're very close to the compute layer. Um, you think about file storage, you think about memory, you think about query optimization, um, and sort of the historical analog I would use from like, you know, the software engineering world is sort of your, your DBAs and your, your, your infrastructure architecture. And really what you're doing, again, is you're optimizing infrastructure to ingest, store, transform, and serve data. So for data science, um, and this is probably one of the things that bothers me the most, uh, a lot of times you hear this very interchangeably with ML. The problem is that ML also gets used to mean deep learning. Um, it also gets used to mean uh, like people in the Philippines answering your questions instead of the you know, the ML agent you think it is. Um, and really what I think of as the mindset here is it's not about, you know, the, the PhD, like, in statistics. It's not about, oh, am I using scikit-learn? It's not about, oh, am I using GBMs or JLMs or whatever. Uh, it's really this, like, product and business mindset. Um, because at the end of the day, your value is not the, whatever model you chose and whatever, you know, technical skills you have. It's what did you do for the bottom line? Um, and oftentimes, you're optimizing a metric that directly hits your bottom line. So whether it's if you're an ad tech, whether you're looking at clicks and eventually you know, impressions to clicks to you know, conversions to revenue, um, whether you're looking at you know, recommender systems if you're an e-commerce business, um, you know, whether you're looking at you know, clothing if you're Stitch Fix, whatever it is, at the end of the day, product and business is what drives your value. Um, and so that's sort of the mindset that you should really have. And the one prereg I would say here is statistics. Um, and I think there's, this is also why like, ML is, like, bothers me, because it encompasses too much to mean anything. And data science itself as a term right now, I think, has that same problem, where it just means too many things and, and ends up not really meaning anything. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, you're looking at user product business decisions. And then deep learning. Um, the misnomer here is AI. I think this is really dangerous for a few reasons. One, um, there's been a ton of AI winters. And like I think in around the 1970s, you know, some famous people were like, AI is going to take all our jobs. 80s. 80s. OK, late, 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 late 70s. Um, and you know, we've, we've seen that happen already. We, um, and it did not bode well for us. So I think to overhype it is actually um, bad for the overall like, research and overall like, you know, pace of in innovation. Um, and the other thing is that deep learning is sort of one breakthrough. It's the first breakthrough we've had in a while in this area. Um, but it, it may not be the defining breakthrough. There may be, there's some really interesting work now done on um, uh, sort of like using um, more like biological or like um, more like experimental frameworks or, that are not necessarily deep learning or looking at various like, like cl taking classical optimization techniques and then scaling those. Um, so deep learning just has to, happens to be the first sort of like step function change we've had towards AI, but it may not be the defining 
Um, and I would say the mindset here, um, I've said this before, but I think if you're doing deep learning, your mindset is much more similar to like a biology researcher than it is to a software engineer. And I think the main thing that differentiates this, besides the fact that it's sort of a fundamentally different way of coding, is like you're no longer writing explicit code. Um, you're sort of you know, writing a learning system um, that will sort of you know, learn whatever the underlying code or structure should be. And um, at the heart of everything is this sort of notion of um, st stochastic uh, like unpredictability in what you're doing. So if you're a software engineer and you're, you know, you're told that you have to build an API, you roughly know how long that takes, you roughly know how to do it, and you can test it pretty straightforwardly. And you can scope it out and you can say, yes, I will build this API, I will do it in a month, it will look like this, and these are sort of the properties it has. Um, however, if you're told to build a you know, self-driving car vision model, for example, and you, you, you are working on the perception part of this, um, it's very hard to say, in three months, I will definitely guarantee that I have a you know, X percent improvement on this vision model, and um, I will cover X, Y, Z edge cases. Um, and so that like, non-deterministic nature makes it so that really what you're doing is you're running a ton of experiments to see what will work and to see what will make it better with no guarantees. Um, and yeah, ultimately, you're trying to like rework these models um, to implicitly learn what's difficult to explicitly code. So in terms of looking at the overall system, this is where I'm zooming out more into like industry stuff. Um, for data engineering, um, there's a, if I had to like map out everything, there's basically a chart that looks a lot like this, where there's just a ton of tools. Um, it changes like every few years. Um, there's basically a hodgepodge. There's not like one tool that you just use and it works. It's like there's at least five or six tools you're using all at once, each tool doing one specific thing. Um, there's a lot of you know, coordination overhead. And at the end of the day, uh, you're really serving a ton of different teams. You're almost like an internal startup to like all of these other uh, clients. Um, and so you have a lot of you know, needs, um, specialized tooling. Um, a lot of times there's this fear that you have like a vendor lock-in to a particular tech stack because migration is super difficult. Um, so if you're Facebook and you're the data infrastructure layer of Facebook, you can't just say, hold up guys, or are going to temporarily pause for two days while we migrate you know, billions and billions of rows from one system to another. Um, so then you end up maintaining legacy infrastructure and legacy legacy infrastructure. Um, so that's sort of a lot of the sort of expenses and things that I would call, call out. Um, for data science, uh, despite the fact that a lot of people say they're AI companies now, they're still much closer to like classic ML companies, so companies that are not using deep learning. And what that really means is they have a dependency on the data engineering and the data infrastructure first being there. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're a data-driven company and you've hired a data scientist before you've hired a data engineer, that's somewhat questionable because your data scientist will basically end up being your data engineer until you have a system in place for them to use. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there's still a lot of hand-tuned feature engineering and that's like another differentiator between the sort of classic ML systems where you're still really like hand shaping it versus you know deep learning where you're where you're just sort of hands off um, and when you're trying to hire because this term means so many things to so many people uh, it creates a lot of noise so again the expenses are you know data dependencies um, thinking about how you'll like organizationally fit this um, and the fact that you need data eng before you need data science uh, for deep learning it's sort of the Wild West, um, as we talked about before, and I think one of the biggest blockers and bottlenecks right now to innovation is uh, this lack of DevOps support. So for software engineering to be like what it is today, the fact that everyone can just roll out their own web apps and mobile apps like in a week is because we have so much DevOps infrastructure to sort of empower people. And we don't really have that for deep learning, and it's also harder uh, than it is, I think, in software to make that happen because it's not just about 
um, you know, building like an abstraction layer. It's about managing compute, managing data, um, and like also helping to helping to debug. Um, and again, so the expenses here, uh, there's like one quote that where someone was looking at sort of minimum wage workers um, in like New York City, and then looking at how much uh, Amazon GPUs cost, and it was roughly the same. Um, so basically, you can think about your compute costs as you are paying, uh, you know, a person to constantly, you know, stay online, constantly train your models, and as you need to scale your compute costs, it gets really expensive. And because of the experimental nature, you can't really guarantee that, you know, what your the experiment like, you know, 5007 that you're running right now is going to get you that X percent increase. You may end up needing to run a lot of experiments where most of them don't end up working out. Um, and that means you've dropped a lot of money. Um, and the other thing is that if you're hiring for an ML engineer, that is really expensive. And unless you know, you're Google or Netflix or someone, um, it's pretty hard to hire because the demand is far outpacing the supply. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of like, the major sort of system expenses. So, um, but it's OK. We, we'll keep calm. And uh, let's jump on the bandwagon a second and talk about current trends. So um, these are just some trends that I'll pick out at a glance. And this is, again, something that's very specific to like this moment in time. So give or take a few months um, in either direction, it's, things look pretty different. But I would say right now, things I'm noticing in data engineering is a lot of pipeline building is getting commoditized. And what I mean by that is what used to happen and why things like Luigi um, from uh, Spotify and Airflow from Airbnb existed was uh, people were manually writing all of the glue code to say, I'm going to take this data from this place and move it in this way and then put it in this place over there. And then I'm going to take that data and then do this other piece and then move it over there. Um, and every piece of that, someone had to explicitly hand code. And a lot of that is getting commoditized. So now you just say, I'm going to you know, like take this and move it here. And you just like call existing functions that people have written. Um, so it's much faster to be able to do that piece. And the other thing, thankfully, is that <laughs> um, a lot of these industry standards are maturing. And they're starting to favor open source. Um, and I think this is good for a lot of reasons. It used to be that there was extreme like hyper fragmentation of all of these um, types of you know, tooling technologies that data engineers would use. It was very unclear what was good. And in my opinion, they were all sort of mediocre. Um, but finally, sort of we've learned over time. And uh, we, you know, we now have things that are more mature, that can handle a lot of scale, that are much more reasonably thought out than things used to be. Um, and also the good part is because a lot of them are open source, um, it allows a lot of people to be able to build good data infrastructure systems. Um, so some examples I'll call out, which are sort of um, you know, golden child du jour, uh, include BigQuery, Kubernetes, Spark, uh, GraphQL, and the, Elast the Elastic Stack, um, previously known, known as the Elk Stack. So for, for data science, um, I think one sort of interesting thing to see is that a lot of this is bleeding out of the tech industry into a lot of different verticals. So you can see this in a lot of data-driven journalism, um, where you know, like places like BuzzFeed have an entire data science team. Um, you can you know see this uh, uh, across like some political systems that are or you know political organizations that are coming up. Um, you can see this in like a lot of you know medical systems. Um, so it, it used to be something that was tech specific, but now is in a ton of different industries. Um, not always called data scientist. Um, the other thing I'm seeing is it used to be that everyone claimed they were a data scientist uh, on LinkedIn. And a lot of those same people are now claiming that they're ML engineers. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, like the salaries for ML engineers are much higher because you're implying that you build deep learning models, which Apparently everyone wants because everyone's an AI company, except most of these AI companies are, again, people outsourced in the Philippines. Um, so it's quite misleading. Um, but that's something to watch out for if you're looking to hire. Um, try to avoid both these terms. 
another good thing that I'm seeing is um, more containerized <coughs> models. So it used to be that um, you know, con like having a model was basically a pain in terms of how to use it, how to transfer it, um, doing like model versioning, making it reproducible. Um, and now that you know our whole like tech world is getting containerized, um, we're seeing models getting containerized as well. Um, and the last thing is there's always been this debate in the data science community about should I learn Python or should I learn R? Python is far outpacing that. Um, and a lot of that is, um, I think, driven not just by uh, how deep learning is essentially built on Python, but also um, the flexibility that allows you to uh, you know, turn that quickly into like a Flask app, for example. Um, which you know you can do with R, R but is quite painful. Um, so again, sort of uh, the data scientist moving a little bit closer to being an engineer. And then deep learning, um, this is sort of like the most exciting field. Um, and if you're in it, probably a little bit more obvious than some of these trends. Um, but it's really like a golden point for NLP. And the sort of historical you know, hype around you know, image processing and like a lot of the you know, image-based models is that we were able to take a pre-trained model, do transfer learning on it, and then apply that more specific image model to do a ton of different things. But we have not, um, until this point, been able to apply effective transfer learning for NLP. Um, but now we can. So we have these uh, generalized transformer-based language models that can now, um, you know, like Google can train it on their giant uh, data set, which is BERT. Um, and that was basically just feeding in all of the text from Wikipedia, um, you know, be using like a, a, a bi-directional transformer. And then um, someone else, so like a small team of, you know, researchers and academics who like don't have that data, don't have that money, um, are able to then make something like BioBERT, uh, where they fine tune this you know, beefy Google model, and then apply it to learn medical terms. And it's able to do that really well. Um, so now we have this one giant model that can then do a ton of different applications. Um, BERT and GPT-2, which came out of OpenAI, beat essentially um, most of the state of the art in like at least n across like nine different benchmarks. Um, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, we have a new age of really specialized hardware. Um, if you look at like, Moore's Law, it's definitely dead, in case you haven't already read that. But also, hardware used to be um, sort of as general as possible. Like, we want to build this one thing that lets you do a ton of things, um, which is basically the CPU. Um, and at, you know, very early on, when we were first you know, making ourselves known as Silicon Valley, um, a lot of the silicon was specialized, and people were like, nah, like, that's not going to be useful. Um, but now it's sort of like, all those naysayers are <laughs> you know, on, the, on the other end of that, which is now we want to be as specialized as possible. Um, and what that really means is we want to be able to do tensor products, um, which is sort of the heart of all of the calculations needed for deep learning. Um, so this includes Google's TPUs, GraphCore's IPUs, um, Light Matter, which is the startup that now is doing photonics, um, silicon photonics. Um, and looking at a lot of custom hardware architectures, which no one has had to touch in years. Uh, so pretty exciting. Um, so I'm going to show like in, in a sample data system just to give you a more concrete sense of what this could look like. Um, you may have heard some of these terms. The Elastic um, stash, stack that I mentioned earlier is essentially Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. Um, but this is just showing you, like, let's say you have an event stream coming in. Um, whether that's people clicking through websites, um, you know, whether that's like YouTube views, um, someone using your mobile app um, and engaging with it. And uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is to be able to just capture that. So like in ingest system, you have a messaging queue. Um, and before you like do anything, you want to make sure you capture that. And um, you know, one sort of, again, industry standard that people will use is Kafka. Um, so after you've captured that, then uh, the other thing is like maybe you, you have certain logs from these events and you want to know what's going on because if you're going to build this complicated data layer, you want to make sure it's reliable, it's not going to fail, you haven't lost anything. Um, and you know, I, I went to a talk by a famous data engineer at, at Twitter and he was like, one of the hardest things 
is counting. Um, and that's because you're counting at a really fast rate and you're counting a lot of data. Uh, so, you know, it's non-trivial to like track how you're counting and whether you're counting well, and that, that's sort of what this logging layer is doing. And if you remember, um, we go back to like Maslow's pyramid for, for data, that's really this layer. So the next layer is this. This is like the exciting part. So this is where we're doing all the analytics. This is where um, you know, we're doing like the data insights, like the BI, all that stuff. Um, so if you haven't heard of Spark, uh, you should sort of be aware of that. Um, Apache Spark is basically this really fast in-memory compute um, system that was originally started by um, a bunch of PhD CS students from Berkeley um, in this organization called Databricks. Um, David Patterson, who's a legend, we've actually had him here before, um, sort of spearheads a lot of that. Um, but they were basically able to say, hey, let's load everything in memory before we do the compute, and that was sort of like a big breakthrough. Um, doing that well is tricky, um, and I remember very painfully dealing with Spark 1.0, but now we're on Spark 2.0, and it's much better. Um, so this is where you're really starting to like transform the data. You're like manipulating it into certain views. Um, you're like making certain calculations beyond just counting things. Um, and in order for this to run, if you're loading a ton of data into memory and you're trying to orchestrate it, you need sort of like a cluster orchestration system. Um, and so Kubernetes is like really starting to win the game there. So after you have that, then you're like, okay, we've created all these like interesting views and um, you know ways of like looking at the data, slicing and dicing. Now we need to dump that somewhere. Um, and you know, BigQuery again is coming out as sort of like a winner there in terms of dumping a lot of this analytical data and allowing you to quickly um, sort of query from it. And so the key thing with uh, BigQuery, which is built off of a lot of like internal Google systems, like um, Dremel, for example, um, is that if you look at like a classic relational database, everything is like in these nicely structured rows. Um, but BigQuery is looking at um, like a columnar store. And so it's assuming that you're going to do a lot of complicated analytical queries across tons and tons of rows, but just for a few columns. And so you're able to do that really quickly. Um, and this classically is known as a data warehouse because um, you can do quick analytics. Um, and you can use something like Periscope to basically empower people who may or may not be um, data scientists to run their own SQL queries, build their own dashboards, and get insights. So this is a sample deep learning system. And um, this is all pseudocode. It's not going to actually work. And I'm skipping a lot of code here. But just to give you a sense of like what it could look like and have it be more concrete, um, I think a lot of people forget this has to exist and go straight to here. And they also forget this part. Um, and you know, I think this is actually a huge factor, um, because if it's garbage in, then it's going to be garbage out. Um, so I just really want to call that in here. Um, a, few, a few big blockers is that a lot of deep learning systems um, are, at the end of the day, massive supervised learning problems. And what that means is you're looking at tons of labeled data. So just wanted to call out uh, Scale API and Figure 8 as examples of um, sort of services that basically allow you to do that. And I can see that being like a whole growing field of like a new kind of job where people are just labeling massive data sets. Um, Preprocessing is super important. Uh, if you don't normalize your data sets, your model may not converge. Um, so again, another example of garbage in, garbage out. Um, and, and again, I think what a lot of people think about models, like um, underlying that is you know, some sort of GPU cluster or something, or TPU cluster, whatever it is. Um, and one thing I'll call out is it's really hard to debug deep learning systems. And if you've tried, again, because it's non-deterministic, um, you don't only have sort of your classic software bugs where you're like, oh, I you know, assigned the wrong value or whatever. Um, but you also can have other kinds of bugs that don't exist in software engineering. So you can have, for example, a linear algebra bug where you're like, oh, my shapes don't match and I can't multiply uh, you know, this matrix and this matrix. Um, you can have like a representation bug where you're like, yes, all of my matrix, all of my matrices you know, like, check out, 
except that um, you know it just so happens that uh, like my columns and my value, like my rows were the same size, and I mix them up, and so you're actually getting nonsense. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of, or you just have like a GPU issue, and you're like, I've never worked with GPUs. How does this work? So there's a lot of kinds of bugs that come up um, when trying to like debug deep learning systems that don't come up in classical sort of software. Um, and the other thing I'll sort of call it here is uh, if you want to like look into visualizations of people actually building this, um, this is sort of like in parallel to Jupyter Notebooks for data science is looking at um, Google's collab. Uh, so now for some flavorful opinions. Um, I'm going to sort of state these just like bluntly, but uh, I just want to say that this is with caveats. This is like shouldn't be taken out of context, um, where the context is like you know you're in tech, you're probably looking at a startup, um, and you probably want to like go into one of these fields. Um, so some opinions on data engineering. So I think if you're hiring, um, it's one of the most underrated. Uh, roles to hire for. Like, nobody thinks about hiring for a data engineer or is like ever really excited about it. But if you look at all the major data companies out there today, um, they have a lot of roles for data engineers and typically more for engineers than for scientists. Um, yeah, order of operations, hire your engineer before your scientist. Um, and really think of them as a force multiplier for the rest of your team. Like, if you have one good data engineer and they're able to build a good system, um, where you know it only takes you like a couple seconds to like make a query or make a dashboard, um, that's really empowering. Whereas if you don't have that and it takes you an hour every time and everything breaks and you don't know how to use it, then um, you're like horribly inefficient. So it's really it's really worth it to get a good data engineer. And um, a data engineer is not a back end engineer. So um, you know I think a lot of times people think, oh well if I'm already an engineer like it's fine. But as you saw in sort of the specialized systems, there were a lot of technologies there, and you don't want to spend time ramping someone up for six months so that they can learn all of those, you know, a dozen, like dozens of technologies. You want them ready to go. Um, so really, what you're looking for is essentially like an infrastructure specialist. Um, if you want to transition into it, um, I would basically consider learning these tools so that you can specialize, and then also learning these concepts, which are basically the end-to-end -end system of everything that you need. Um, and finally, like what I think a good data engineer is, is they're excited by infrastructure. Like They don't actually want to be building the models. They want to be optimizing the models for everyone else. Um, and what I also think is underrated, and a lot of data engineers don't care about, but really, really should, is data governance. Um, so that basically means what is happening to your data along every step of the way? Um, is it reliable? Is it private? And is it secure? Um, and I think especially, like some people, like most people would be like, yes, I care about reliability. Some people would be like, yes, I care about privacy because I have to. Um, few people will think about security until it's too late. Um, so in, in one tagline, I would say your data engineer is your 10x engineer for everyone else. For data science, um, again, I think it's super noisy. So uh, I would recommend that you don't actually hire for a data scientist, because what does that mean? If you need a recommendation scientist, say you need a recommendation scientist. If you need a perception engineer, say you need a perception engineer. Um, I would favor people who have launched models in the real world. It's really, really different than having your toy R model. Um, and I would favor people who have a product mindset over an engineering mindset. That's what your data engineer is for. If they're not thinking about the product, then they can waste a whole month building a beautiful model that doesn't drive any metrics. Um, and when you're interviewing, I would say whether you're doing a take home or whether you're bringing them on set, si um, simulate the real world as much as possible. Literally give them access to some you know, partition part of your production database. Give them a problem that you have right now um, and see what they can do with it. Uh, don't just quiz them on what is a you know, generalized linear model. Um, <laughs> if you want to transition into being a data scientist, I would say um, order of operations is first be a data janitor, because uh, 
you're not going to have a data engineer do that for you. Um, and at the end of the day, like especially if you're working at a startup, you need to be able to do that yourself. Um, being able to build something end to end and not just a model in the middle. Um, and then learn stats in Python and then learn Git and Jupyter. Um, and another thing I think is underrated is the scikit-learn docs. Um, I know docs are typically boring, but they're extremely well written. They're um, actually pretty human readable and they have pretty pictures. Uh, a good data scientist, um, in my mind again, not only has a strong product mindset, but is a good visual communicator. So if they're able to show, if they're able to show like the graphs that really like convey things instead of you know talking s statistics at you, um, that makes a huge difference. Um, and I would liken them to having a lot of like cross-functional capabilities and being able to again serve a lot of other people in the org. Um, being able to justify the assumptions that they make. Uh, and then, again, like iterate, iterating on a model and being able to push that to production rather than just having something super complicated that is not useful. Um, so the tagline is, I think of them actually similar to a PM. Um, they're just a data-driven PM. And finally, deep learning. Um, besides the fact that they're super expensive, I think uh, unfortunately, the only people who can afford them now are the big tech companies. Um, but you don't need to have the best people, just like you don't need to have Guido if you're building a Python app. Uh, so I would say if you're able to get like an okay one um, and have that person train all of your other engineers, um, that's much more valuable. If you're transitioning into it, um, I think it's one of those things where if you jump into it in the beginning, it's kind of overwhelming and you'll waste your time. So you definitely want some sort of background first, uh, whether you're taking a fast AI course um, or learning from real examples. Um, and then I would try to jump into it, build a model end to end and start with the simplest thing possible. Um, and the last thing is, I don't know if people realize this, but basically every large tech company and a lot of other non-tech com companies and like some foundations will offer um, an AI like fellowship or scholarship or you know three month program, whatever it is, or internship. Um, and you know you see a lot of people that say they're an AI resident and then they transition into being an ML researcher or um, engineer. Um, and this is really good for a few reasons, like one, Compute is expensive, and um, it's nice if you're learning on someone else's dime. Um, the other thing is getting large data sets is expensive and annoying, and it's nice if someone just gives that to you. Um, and, and lastly, it gives you a chance to really like iterate on your model performance. And it's one thing to build a model, and it's like a whole other thing to like debug and iterate. Again, I cannot emphasize how much trickier it is to debug deep learning models than it is to debug anything in software 1.0 land. Um, but I would strongly sort of like suggest you trying to do a fellowship. Uh, and if you're, oh yeah. Uh, and if you're, if you're a good deep learning engineer or researcher, um, I think this is where like the bar is pretty high right now and we need to educate a lot more people in a lot more represent, like representative fields um, and not just sort of the people who are already like super privileged here. Um, but you want to know some amount of linear algebra and calculus. Um, you want to be able to, for like debugging purposes, do DevOps um, and data engineering. Um, you want to basically know either TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, and I think if you're good, you care about not building something terrible. And there's a lot of people who are building terrible things. <laughs> um, and again, like you're able to debug super effectively. Uh, and choose good experiments. I think if you're like, oh, this kind of work, but it could be better, here's like 50 things to try. Um, you want to be able to go from those 50 things to be like, what are the next three things I should try, um, which will give me like the highest likelihood of succeeding. Um, and the, the last thing is like caring how your data and architecture can affect your model. So if someone's like, okay, if I twiddle the step size, what does that mean? If I like change this loss function, like what does that mean? Um, and you should be able to have a good sense of that because if you don't, it's really expensive to retrain a model. Um, and so I would call this like the future hedge. If you want to be part of the future, you want to hedge some part of your life towards AI, uh, 
then I suggest looking into deep learning. Um, so Andre Karpathy has this terminology of software 2.0, which he calls deep learning. Um, and kind of like how people were saying before, software is eating the world. Um, he's sort of making the argument that software 2.0 is eating software 1.0, um, where 2.0 is really referring to sort of deep learning and like our current AI boom. Um, I would also say that 1.0 is getting commoditized. So a lot of people, there's like tons of sites now where like if you do not know how to code at all, you can essentially drag and drop and make an app or make a website or make whatever it is you need to make. Um, but 2.0 is still super custom uh, and is kind of a wild west. So I'm not going to go over these too much because this is getting slightly nitty gritty, but just to get a bit more specific, um, here's a ton of uh, technologies I'm just going to throw at you. Um, I've organized it in terms of like the main thing that they do, roughly in the order of things that you might need to care about them. Um, in terms of data science, similar thing, like roughly how you can think about algorithms. Um, and then deep learning uh, for a lot of the types of net architectures out there. What is sort of like the one word takeaway of um, what type of problems they are best applied to. Uh, we can talk about this later if people are interested. Um, so some problems that we need to solve today, and this is starting to look more into the future, um, into sort of like an AI-centric world. Um, there's tons of links here that you know I'll share it out and you can look at later. Um, so I won't go over anything in here in super detail, but uh, I would say like there's a lot of problems to solve. Um, there's a lot to do, um, and it's like a super exciting field to be in. Um, and not everything is, you know, like requires you to be a machine learning engineer. Um, so this is something that uh, Andreessen Horowitz put together, um, but I thought it was like a good way to think about, you know, are you going to be automated out or are you not? Um, and basically the takeaway is the more sort of you're leveraging the things that humans are really good at, and that machines are really bad at, uh, the less of an existential crisis you will have in the future. Um, so if you're looking at things that require a lot of creativity or strategy and require a lot of compassion and really where people care about having that you know, human touch, um, you'll probably not be uh, as automated as early as people who are in roles where um, you know, it's like there's very clear optimization frameworks. You can codify what they're doing and their objectives in math. Um, and you don't really need to interact with people. It's just machines talking to machines. So if you want to be part of this, um, I, I sort of framed it as three different ways. You can either build it, you can invest it or start in it, or you can reframe it uh, for the rest of society. Um, so I think if you're building it, then again, like, there are some ways to upskill yourself. Um, the one thing I'll say here is like, you want to produce more uh, sort of results than sort of like reading that you're consuming to increase your own learning rate. Um, if you're trying to invest uh, in it or start something, um, I sort of called out like the trade-offs for some of these. I still think they're really important to invest in more tooling infrastructure. Um, and I think right now we have really like lots of exciting work done in research, but none of that is shipping to production. None of that is getting actually translated or applied um, to like real world businesses. Um, and the last thing I think is like, there's a lot of legacy infrastructure, legacy industries. Um, and I'm calling out specifically agriculture because I think that's gonna be huge for like humanity uh, to work on. Um, but yeah, some trade-offs. Uh, tooling is competitive and immature. Like, it's going to be dominated by a few people. Um, in terms of real-world applications, um, it's, again, there's like a huge bottleneck there in terms of translating research into like useful products. Um, and for legacy like, industries, uh, long time horizons and a lot of capital. The last thing, I think this is the most interesting thing, is like if you're not technical or if you think that you know, there's only so much you can do as an engineer um, in like this whole craze, there's a lot of higher order, um, higher level sort of like societal roles that I think are super important. Um, AI policy is probably the biggest one. Um, if you look at like some 
you know, websites like 80,000 Hours, they highly recommend people going into this because we have a huge gap. Um, and the faster we can have better AI policy, um, sort of the better we can prevent ourselves from doing terrible things to each other. Um, and also I think there will be increasing demand for these roles um, which don't exist today uh, compared to other roles that might get automated out. Um, and this one is kind of tongue in cheek, but um, in Chinese, AI is and uh, you know, I think it's, it's going to be uh, very difficult to like, think about the entire AI industry if you don't look at what's going on in China. Um, a lot of the views here are, again, very US-centric, but they're doing a ton of stuff. Um, and like one newsletter that I subscribe to is uh, Jeff Ding, who writes basically about AI from a China perspective. Um, and it's super fascinating because um, it's like a very different environment to operate in. So definitely recommend that. And finally, like I can think of this like data transform to jobs, where if you think about software 1.0 to like 2.0, um, this is what a lot of people will sort of be migrating towards, if not already. Um, and I think the most interesting thing that you know I think should happen, and I already see happening, is people in like biz product operations roles essentially becoming data scientists. So if you want to start, um, there's tons of resources if you Google any of these to get started. Um, but I sort of picked my favorite ones for each like, field um, just to have a single starting point. Um, and then I have some more uh, sort of picked out recs on the industry, on technical resources, um, and keeping up with AI. So yeah, that's everything I have. Thank you. Yeah. So when you say tooling infrastructure, you don't mean data engineering. Yeah. So this is um, so this is specifically like the AI future, I guess. Oh. So it's not talking about like everything in tech. It's just talking about sort of if you want to hedge towards you know deep learning and where it's going. So um, I'm saying it's similar to DevOps and data engineering for software 1.0, but this is really for deep learning, like DevOps to support that. What's an example of tooling infrastructure? Yeah, so, um, so one of my friend's companies is called Weights and Biases. Um, and uh, so like, you know, OpenAI, Toyota, et cetera, um, Uber are using them. And basically they allow you to see like not only what you're doing, but like, okay, I'm working on this piece of the model, he's working on that part of the model, she's working on that. Um, how are we all doing? being able to compare and like graph everything in terms of like how are my loss functions doing um, in terms of like oh you know how much how many resources am I using and then also how is it doing on inference so like okay I've deployed this model you know let's say I have an example where it just is failing um, spectacularly being able to like see that really quickly instead of having to dig through like 20,000 examples manually and like run it and like you know get an output um, and so like the time from basically like closing the feedback loop on iterating on models. Yeah. There was that one slide that you talked about yeah. an example stack for data um, engineer. Yeah, this, this one. one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe this is a question for you, maybe offline, but like, yeah. you know, there's like 10 things here, right? Yeah. And a startup has to go from having none of these things to 10 things. Yeah. Is there a way to think about the journey from going from like, right. I have to do all of this or I have to do like a subset of this? Yeah, like, like what is the minimal yeah, place yeah, to get yeah, started? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a data system at scale um, because if you're not at scale, then, you know, honestly, like Google Sheets takes you really far um, <laughs> before that breaks. So, you know, I would sort of just like start there. Um, I think if, you, if you're like, what do I sort of minimal viable need, especially if you have like sort of an event-driven, log-driven kind of application, um, you don't even need any of this stuff really. Um, but I think having some sort of like store, of, like, you know, you, may, you don't even really need Kafka, having some sort of store of your logs is really important. Um, this is, if you think about this, this is like the bottom of, um, you know, this pyramid. Where you're like, at least I'm tracking every single thing that's happening. And I, at least I have that. And if anything goes super wrong, you know, I can like jump in. Um, so this is sort of like 
level one. Um, I would say if you then you're like, now I really want to do some analytics, again, like, you know, this you may not need, like, this you may not need. You can just, like, write some pipeline that goes straight here. Um, and then, you know, have, like, a dashboard. And obviously you want, like, you know, S3 or something to just dump everything into. Um, but that, that would be sort of, like, minimal viable. Yeah. Can you go back to the pyramid? Yeah. Where are you seeing the most interesting companies getting started today? in this pyramid? Mm, yeah, so a lot of the pyramid, like from here to here, there's already tons of stuff in that space. And I think that's because it's been around longer. Um, so like whatever has been around longer has now, um, like if you look at this slide where I'm talking about trends, like a lot of the stuff in data engineering, which is like the first three or four layers of that pyramid, um, we're seeing, again, like maturing industry standards, and a lot of that is, again, open source. Um, but things so, like Kafka and stuff like that, they only came out about four years ago. Yeah. Um, so, like, I would say every few years, there's, like, you know, there's, like, another iteration on that. Um, but because there's so many players, it is, like, a pretty fragmented space. And... Um, and if you look at, uh, you know, like one thing I had mentioned before is a lot of the migration pains and like tech stack lock-in. Um, so I would say like, you know, at some point, like every, I don't know, like let's say four years, you'll, there'll probably be like another iteration of that. Um, and it like gets more and more, um, more and more mature. Um, but it's pretty hard to like be thoughtful about it and make something that's more mature. Like it's, uh, like you need to have talked to a lot of people. You need to be like super thoughtful, etc. So you're um, talking about the top two. Uh, so that's like a lot of like this layer. Yep. Um, and like I would say here is where um, this is why I had like a slide on just that um, at the end. Yeah. So that's like the. Like this line. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of activity, like this is not happening right now, and like it it really should. I think this is the piece that you know we don't yet have. Like we have tons of research that's just like not getting translated into um, a lot of these applications. But how um, can it get translated if you don't have access to the data source? Yeah, so um, it depends on the application, like. One is, you know, if you have like a legacy industry, for example, um, then you either create that or you already have it and you're just not doing anything about it. Um, the other thing is that like, you know, you, you can like start building an application that like collects it. So like I think one example where, um, you, you know, for example, there's this company called VIP Kid um, coming out of China and like they're sitting on like a giant mountain of data about like, um, like English teachers. Um, and so it's just because it's like not open doesn't mean uh, you know you, you can't like make it happen. Um, and the other thing is like for some of these it doesn't have to be necessarily a deep learning thing where you need tons and tons of label data. Um, I think even like machine learning in a lot of these like uh, historical industries can do a lot. Can you talk a little bit about like where AI policy is now and if we're at like a really primitive state like where you think it would be productive not just for like society as a whole, but also how can we like keep doing our jobs to not get like encumbered by policy, yeah. but actually have it be, I mean, maybe this is like a pipe dream, but yeah, have it be helpful for us to do our jobs and also not like hold society back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think like, unfortunately, like GDPR was sort of like a naive attempt where they're like, oh, like, let's try to do something about you know, data privacy and awareness, and like that's really holding a lot of industries back, and it's just sort of this expensive like regulation upkeep effort. Um, and so, you know, like I think there's um, like regulation is like not necessarily the same thing as policy. Um, it may be just like a subset of that. Um, I do think we are super nation in thinking about policy, um, and I think there really needs to be people who are. Um, both, like, not just people who come from the technical background and are like, I understand, you know, deep learning or like machine learning systems, 
but people who come from, and this is why I say like social science, um, whether it's like, you know, econ or like maybe even anthropology or like psychology um, to think about like, okay, well, what are, um, you know, like incentive structures that we should think about? Um, so I think like Future of you know, Humanity slash Life Institute is thinking about this. Um, some people at Open Air are thinking about this. Um, there's like some research at, done at various universities about this. Um, there's, uh, you know, like a few like AI Now Institute or like AR for All. Like there's, there's a lot of these like organizations that are starting to form, um, but a lot of them are sort of outside of, um, they're sort of like tangential to policy right now. Uh, and I think we sort of need to be able to have representation within government. <laughs> Um, especially because it takes a long time. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of like regulations, um, it's, it's actually like I think really hard to talk, like a lot of people talk about fairness. Um, I think it's really hard to talk about fairness because there's like at least three definitions of it. And you know, if you take any two of those definitions, it may work, but if you try to do like all three definitions, um, you're, you actually have like competing objectives. Um, so then you, you know, you can't actually like maximize all three of them at the same time. Um, so I think of it less as like specific regulations on like, you know, let's be maximally fair and more on like, how can I create incentives? Um, I, like I think global policy is really interesting to think about. How can I create incentives so that we don't fall into like a nuclear war situation or like a cold war situation um, where it's like in, an arms race as opposed to like sharing data. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of ways that can translate is, like, maybe not even at the, um, you know, ML level, but even just at the data level of, like, can we securely um, share distributed data sets with each other, um, for example. So, like, yeah. conversely, do you think if we, do you think it also might be productive to, like, take a step above, like, the specific technical implementation? Because I think, like, GDPR maybe is focus like pretty deeply on like specific technologies and the way like right. we Which handle specific data. Not, not the way to go. But yeah. you kind of mentioned like like higher level like steer us away from nuclear war. Yeah. Do you think it's like productive to try and like shape policy in a way that basically then guides like the technology that we like develop underneath that like policy regime? Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, so I, I think um, I don't think policy can guide technology because it's just not going to be able to keep up. Um, I think there, like someone did this analysis where there was like, okay, there's at least like 20 machine learning papers being published every day, um, which is just like impossible. I mean, a lot of that's noise, but it's like impossible to keep up with. Um, but I think like it can be preventative and we, and um, you know, various other industries, I think like biotech, um, for example, had sort of a historical precedent where they're like, this is how we will not be, not accidentally be terrible. Um, and you know, this is how we will like create better incentives. Um, so I think, yeah, thinking at a higher level about global policy, about like, you know, incentives in driving like market forces is um, much more useful than thinking about how to regulate like, you know, individual companies and like whether they show you, you know, site cookies or not. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you yeah. spending most of your time? Um, so I actually don't spend a lot of time, so I'll mention some of these, um, but like a lot of what I do is see who else is spending most of their time thinking about this and then I just subscribe to them. Um, and you know, I think part of it is also like because there's so much to keep up with, um, it's really easy to like get lost in the noise. Um, so typically I'm just like, okay, well, how important is this relative to everything else that's going on? And if it's not super important, then I just like, so don't. Tactically, what do you, which yeah. part of this are you spending your time on? Like in terms of building or in terms of building? Yeah. Um, in, in terms of like, like which one of these or something? Yeah. Or? Or even if you're looking at the pyramid or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think, like, I actually care the most about this. Um, so I mentioned like you know education here for example, but um, I think a lot of it is like there's a few people who like understand what's going on, and then there's a lot of people who like read the news, which is like very misleading. 
And then there's a lot of people who like don't even get exposed to that. Um, I was playing around with like Google Trends, uh, and it's like very like if you even if you know nothing about the U.S., you can sort of see very clearly. There's like two Americas. There's like the coasts, and then there's the Midwest. Um, just based on like, you know, how much did they Google like Spark um, or like Kafka, for example. Um, and so I think that's probably the thing I care about the most is like education or like reaching people who like may not think about this um, and uh, sort of like raising awareness. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.